paperwork sort of the usual sort of uh, e amble. Uh, so I think Zara's already told you that uh, it's going to be rejected. Uh, and if you aren't happy with that, then please let us know. I never know what we would do about it, whether we put a finger over your face or something. I don't know. Everybody happy? Right, that's fine. Um, always encourage discussion and contributions about how we can work together and look forward to your questions and thoughts. Uh, we also accept that there will be times when we have different views and want to ensure these are heard. However, we must remember to treat each other with respect um, and also the guest speakers in the same way. Uh, the Kingsham Area Forum is one of five forums across Bath and North East Somerset, and they have all built a reputation among key decision makers of being well informed and positive. So our contributions are valued, and I should like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your attendance uh, and hopefully your input as well. Uh, before we continue, may I remind everyone to keep background noise to a minimum. We only speak one person at a time. And uh, as I'm just about to do, put your telephone on uh, to uh, vibrate or silent. So um, please mute your microphones when not speaking, and then I mute when I invite you to speak. Uh, please indicate if you wish to speak by using the chat facility on Zoom by typing MIS. So may I speak? And I will call you in turn to speak. Uh, please also put your name in the chat so that uh, we're obviously aware of who is saying what and uh, and recording. We have an, a few apologies. Um, Councillor Lisa O'Brien and also Lottie Smith Collins, who is clerk to the Salford Parish Council. Um, updates to go through. Uh, hopefully, you've all become aware over time that uh, on the polling day on the 4th of May this year uh, for the local elections, uh, and it's necessary to have photographic ID if you are going to a polling station. Um, that doesn't apply to uh, votes. Uh, and I'm sure that much more information will come out over the next few weeks. And as I say, most people will be required to have ID and there's a whole variety of um, photographic ID, I'm sure you're aware of, passports, photo card, driving license, blue badge, older person's bus pass uh, and disabled person's bus pass. And you can still your, use your photo ID even if it has expired, uh, providing that the name is the same as on the electoral register and the photo is recognizable of you. Uh, if you do not have these forms of ID, they, then you will need to apply for a free voter authority at a polling station. And these can be obtained online uh, or in person uh, at a council one stop shop. And the deadline for that, folks, is the 25th of April. Uh, we will circulate further information and with the follow up and ask that you help share this uh, via your own networks. A few things more to read. This is uh, the Kentsham High Street heritage in zone and the local cultural program. This is a four-year partnership program between Historic England, Bath and North East Somerset Council and Kingston Town Council. Uh, as part of the program, Kingston's conservation area will be enhanced, creating more attractive, engaging and vibrant high street. Um, I'm almost tempted to say it ought to attract people to take a trip to Kingston, but unfortunately too many people are already stripping in Kingston. Um, a written update has been provided by Bath and North East Somerset Regeneration Team, which will be circulated after this meeting. It includes information about Temple Street improvements and those who are in Kingston or have passed through lately will have seen that they're well underway. 
uh, and also um, you will have details about phase 2A and B currently being delivered. Also, the launch of a new business directory on the High Kingdom website. And there are details of the shopfront improvement schemes. Uh, the first of these has been completed with Make Space, a new community art space located near the Leisure Centre. There is also information on the local cultural programme, including this year's grant programme, which is currently open, and how to put in an expression of interest for this. Uh, we will share the full document in the follow-up to this meeting. If you'd like to receive the update from the meeting, please do put your contact details in the chat. Right, that's um, that's the amble, and um, I obviously decided I haven't said enough previously because that was a fair old trot through, but there we are. Right, we have to keep to time as best we can um, because it is going to be a tight schedule and all of the uh, speakers will be aware of that and be aware of the time slot they've been given. Um, if they can keep within it and if they can even be um, more sparing, then that will help at the back end. But anyway, let's, let's kick off uh, with um aging better and uh introducing simon allen who is the chief executive of age uk baines and uh simon is going to explain more about this new project as well as giving updates on the work of the organization and he will also answer questions so simon your kickoff time is six ten, but you're ahead of the game so um, if we can stay that way, that would be absolutely super. Simon, the floor is yours. Lovely. Thanks, Alan. I'll do my best. Um, hi, everybody. Really lovely to see you all um, and lovely to see some familiar faces that I might not have seen for quite some time. So the information I'm going to share tonight is hot off the press. So <clears throat> so the, the I'm going to talk to you about the Aging Well Network, which is a new network that's been set up. It met for the first time um, a couple of weeks ago under the auspices of, of 3SG, which is our voluntary sector infrastructure organization for Bath and North East Somerset, which I know that um, uh, a lot of you will be, be very familiar with. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go through the set of slides that were shared um, at the session that we held um, a couple of weeks ago at the St. John's Foundation, just to give you some idea about what the Aging Well Network is. It's very much uh, the start of what we hope will become a journey that will include more and more people as it starts to gather pace. But um, <clears throat> really, at, at the fundamental heart of this, it's about the idea and the concept of an age-friendly community. So I'll go through these, these slides as, as quickly as possible. Then I will just touch on a few things that Age UK, Bath and Northeast Somerset are doing ourselves, and then open the floor up for, for, for questions, as you say, Alan. But, um, and, and, you know, some somebody keep an eye on the clock for me. <laughs> um, uh, I'll be able to do my best Chris Whitney now. Here's the next slide. Thanks, Sarah. So I suppose the fundamental question is, why would we want our community to be age friendly? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's no surprise. And I think if you read the, the papers on a regular basis or watch the news, more people are living longer, um, which is a fantastic thing and something that we should celebrate. But however, along alongside growing older, then there may well be additional uh, issues or areas that we all need to be aware of that um, cause us more concern than others. Um, very often in our society, unfortunately, I think that we view getting older and living longer as a burden. So um, when we hear about the hospitals, we talk about bed blocking. When we, when we talk about adult social care, we talk about the huge demand. Um, on local authorities, but actually um, growing older should be um, and can be um, a, a positive experience. And, that, and that's what is at the, at the heart of an age-friendly community. So it's not just about, about individuals, it's about, it's about our society, it's the way that our society works, it's the way that our high streets work, it's the way that our transport works. It's the whole plethora of things that um, make life worth living and life accessible um, and usable um, for people. 
So it's about addressing barriers that, that across all the dimensions of social and, and our physical environment and creating a joined up approach. Um, <clears throat> age friendliness is not just about, about older people. Um, clearly, it is uh, uh, right across the life course. Um, and uh, and uh, what we've seen in recent times, certainly I'm sure some of you saw the sort of programmes um, around um, the work that was carried out at St Monica's, were bringing together generations was incredibly positive for both younger people and for older people. Next slide, please, Sarah. <clears throat> um, I suppose the one thing that we need to point out, the age-friendly community idea is not something that we've kind of plucked out of the air. Um, it has been set up by the World Health Organization, it's been in place for quite a, quite a few years. Um, and it is that framework to create a system-wide place-based approach um, to uh, to create an, a, a a positive community, over over thirty seven countries have, have introduced the idea of an age friendly community, and the UK is 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 one of those. I guess more recently, there's there's been around fourteen um, sites across the UK that have that have worked on developing age friendly uh, community approaches. Bristol being a closest, Melksham being another one, not too far across the border. Um, <clears throat> But what it what it does is it, it it enables us to plan and have a have a continuous cycle of improvement about how how we uh, support the area to become age friendly. Um, very often it is led by voluntary sector organisations like 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 my own or or um, the twenty or so organisations that met a couple of weeks ago for the first time. But what's really important is to have um, uh, the involvement and buy in and dedication and commitment from from right across the community so whether that's businesses whether that's um, <clears throat> local government and um, and having that political commitment to involving older people in decision making is crucial to it so there are there are eight domains um, that make up a, a, a an age-friendly community if we move on to the next slide Sarah um, these are the these are the eight, eight domains and interestingly when you look at the agenda for tonight actually uh, you're going to be talking about um, quite a few of those um, <clears throat> in in this, this evening's meeting. So so whether that's transportation and um, there's been lots in in the in the press and, and and we've been we've been talking about um, the changes to the support of bus network and the introduction of demand responsive transport, a, a, a massive issue um, certainly from the older people who have been contacting us. Housing again, that um, and I know Graham's going to be be talking about housing tonight. Incredibly important for the longer term in terms of how do we make sure that that all of our housing stock across Bath and North East Somerset is fit for people to grow old um, uh, in uh, and make and, and remain accessible. Um, I won't go through all of these in in turn, but because hopefully they'll all, they'll all kind of make make sense to you. But. Um, vitally important that all of these elements um, are thought about when we think about an age-friendly friendly community. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so why is it important? Um, I think I've probably covered so much of this, but um, an age-friendly community promotes a preventative approach to, um, to growing older. Um, what we know is that if, if people keep, keep active, then actually they can remain fitter and healthier for longer in their life. Um, it encourages action at all aspects of our local system. So whether it is through voluntary sector organisations, whether it's through local government and, and the council, through town and parish councils, through the NHS, GPs, uh, schools, uh, business, it, it encourages that joined up approach. Um, and, uh, and actually an age friendly community contributes to people's well-being through uh, connecting people together. Um, we know that um, social isolation and loneliness is a is a massive, massive issue um, for people as they grow older for a variety of reasons, whether that's because family have moved away, which is so often the case these days, or as people get older, that sadly the, the, the fact of, of the matter is that, that a lot of friends and loved ones will pass away potentially, and that, that can really play into um, that loneliness and, and isolation. But equally, what we've seen in the past couple of years um, <clears throat> during the pandemic is uh, a, a massive, um, uh, massive move for people to retire and move out of employment. So there's been around 300 to 400,000 people over 50 have left the 
um, the job market across the UK in the last in the last couple of years. And there's something about how not necessarily that um, uh, we want to force people back into employment, but but actually, how, how do we make employment practices age friendly? How do we encourage people to stay um, in employment for longer if that's what they want to do? And um, sadly, uh, some people will have to do that because of their financial circumstances at the moment. But but if people want to stay in employment, how, how do we create a flexible approach to employment? Because very often older people will have caring responsibilities, looking after loved ones, et cetera, or may want to free up some time to, to, to care for their for their grandchildren. Um, but how do we make sure that that employment is, is flexible? And fundamentally, it's about our communities, uh, communities where where people people's well-being is is kind of put at the forefront, where generations of people can come together. Um, that that is for me what 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 creates a strong and resilient community. Um, Sarah, I think that might be the the last slide, and it is. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll pause there. Um, but this is this is very much the start of what we hope was a, as a longer term journey. But if there's any any questions or queries about about that at this point, stunned silence. <laughs> uh, I uh, I can't see any hands obviously up, um, and the don't oh. appear. Oh, sorry, Adri Adrian's waving. Adrian. I think. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. I tried to put in, may I speak in the thing, but you beat me to it. Um, I, I, Simon, good to see you again. Um, I mean, what the agenda you've got there is a massive agenda, isn't it? It cuts across an awful lot of agencies. And um, I think the challenge is going to be getting all those different agencies, housing, transport, employment, and so on and so forth, onto this agenda where at the moment, money seems to be the dominant force. Uh, we see it with transport, quite frankly. Um, so it is, it is a massive agenda. Part of it as well, I think, is a bit of a cultural change. I mean, we've seen the, 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 the sort of divisive politics we've seen lately, setting black against white, young against old, working against not working. And the young against old has been something which has really made my blood boil at times. So we need that cultural change as well sort of through society, um, which we can all help to do, I think, in our own different roles. Um, I'm involved in Community at 67 in Canesham. Uh, we've been doing the warm spaces there now, which is moving into summer. We're looking at really carrying that on into the type of thing which you're talking about now, because predominantly it's been older people which has come to us. It's not only wanted the warm space, but have wanted the, 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 the company, the, the, the interaction with other people. Um, and one of the things we want to do at 67 is to, to build on that intergenerational stuff, to go out and to talk to schools, to talk to uh, youth clubs and places like that where young people tend to be and to build those relationships with those, with those young people. So I guess what I'm saying, really, anything we could do at Community at 67 to support what you're trying to do uh, we'd be more than willing to engage with you in some way to move that agenda along. Fantastic. Thanks, Adrian. I, I, I will absolutely get in touch with you. And I, and I think you're right. It's, it's a massive thing. But, but I think what I see, having, having come into this job now, I, I think 18 months I've been in, been in this post now. And, and I guess what I see when we talk about housing or when we talk about transport or when we talk about those things, that, that there appears to me to be more of a move to, to join the dots around, around some of those things. And, you know, the whole concept of an age-friendly community is one where you, you create a plan, but, but it's a continuous cycle and it's going, to it's going to take time. But I think there's something about um, uh, where, where we can, us making that commitment to doing that um and and whatever small step we can make to make it reality that that that's what we can do so i you know i remain i remain hopeful and positive <laughs> thanks adrian um chris essex i think you want to speak yeah Over just you, just briefly to thank simon uh for yesterday when uh jillian came along to the salford coffee club which had uh, over 60 attendees yesterday 
uh, everybody enjoying free coffee and cake uh, all afternoon. And uh, it was a great, great talk given by Gillian. And she then walked around all the tables and spoke to a vast array, including uh, a few who are on this call here today that I can see. Um, but yeah, really useful her coming and thanks ever so much and engaging with, uh, with the community in Salford. Thank you, Chris. Obviously, my invite hasn't arrived. It's all right. I shan't take offence. <laughs> <laughs> you just a mention of cake, does it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody else? Uh, no? Okay, I think... Um, no, I think I'll put my hand up, old Alan, but do forgive uh, me. Sorry, who's that? Dave Middleton. Dave, sorry again. Yeah, for it. Really aware just recently of a of a Curo initiative that they're just starting, having spoken with James at Curo, um, to encourage uh, older people to think about uh, the size of property that they need now. It's a very emotive subject, but at the point where heating bills are so hugely unaffordable, to be able to have uh, a successful route from uh, a four-bedroom property with one person in it to a one-bedroom property that they can heat a lot cheaper is a really helpful thing. Have you made uh, headway into uh, working with Curo on their project, Simon? They weren't, weren't. So Curo formed part of the Eating Well network, so we absolutely are in, in contact with them. Like, you're absolutely right. The, those issues are massively emotive. Um, and I suppose my, 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 my personal view would be that the, the more that we can encourage people to to almost forward, forward plan and think about think about those issues ahead, ahead of time that's 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 the that's the best time to do that because very very often some of those conversations are happening when maybe somebody's been had a had a hospital stay or their circumstances have changed and and their and their needs have increased and that that's that's a really difficult time to be making some of those some of those decisions but um yeah, we are we are in, we're in contact, and I think again that that's that's the sort of thing that we need a community response to. So there's very much the specifics around the housing, but actually that idea about forward planning, I think, is something that we can all we can all start to have those conversations and think about it. Hi, man. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a quick scan across the screen. We can't see anybody with a hand up, and there are no MISs on the chat. So. I thank you on behalf of the forum for coming along. Um, very enlightening uh, talk. And it was nice the way that you linked your talk to the various other topics tonight. So um, thank you very much. And thank well you. done on the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Take Alan. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to jump off because I've got to go and feed my mum's fish or else no, that, my life won't be worth living. That, that, that's absolutely fine. OK, um, we're moving on now and we are a little bit ahead of time. And uh, the next title we're looking at is Housing Challenges. And we're uh, very pleased to have Graham Saborn, Head of Housing at Beans with us this evening. Uh, and I need to make people aware that um, Graham also has to uh, hop out and he needs to be away at 640, which is the back end of his allocation of time and i'm sure we won't get that far although what you're going to tell us um graham probably is going to be very no not probably will be very interesting um and informative so the floor is yours graham you're muted i was about to say um, i'm not going to point and now i'm without microphone uh, just going to say good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me uh, tonight. Uh, what I wanted to do is just very briefly talk about some of the housing challenges which we're facing, none of which I think be, uh, you won't be aware of. Uh, I, think, I think we're all aware of the housing challenges which we're facing in the district. And then very briefly, just talk about some of the our programmes and some of our solutions. 10 minutes, not enough time to cover it all. So I'm probably just going to kind of focus on some of the really key bits, actually, and some of the key issues. So I wonder whether we can go to straight to the second slide, Sarah, if that's possible. Thank you. Um, sorry, I meant the, the, the previous one. 
So this is some of the kind of big challenges we're facing at the moment. Uh, we're having supply challenges with the housing stock. We're having affordability challenges. And we're all also having service demand challenges. All of them are coming at us at, at quite a quite a frosty. So the supply challenges around our housing stock. Again, I'm sure you know most of this. Generally speaking, we have relatively poor housing stock in the district. It tends to be older. It tends to have lower EPC ratings. We also have a very unbalanced housing stock. So 23% of our housing stock is in the private rented sector. That's very high. Uh, and there's not many local authorities which have that sort of percentage of private rented stock. And we also linked to that have large number of HMOs. Um, and we have Airbnb. We have huge issues around our, our supply of housing. And I should say, uh, you know, this, this slide or this presentation is primarily um, when it's drafted, it, it's kind of Bain's uh, perspective. But Keynesham and the environs around are, are no different to this. They're, they're fairly typical to, to, to these issues. The other thing just to touch on is the affordability issue we have here in, in the district. And I'm not sure whether you can see that graph particularly well, um, but it's the standard typical house price to earnings ratio. Uh, graph which you, you see so often uh, in the press and, and discussed. The, the interesting line is the red line and that shows London, so generally known as one of the you know, least affordable areas in the country and it shows from 1996 to that goes to 2021 just how the house price to earnings ratio has increased in London. Baines, we're not even on that chart, we're off the scale. Um, and I think that's that's the shocker for me. So so we are above that. Um, so our latest house price ratio is twelve point fourteen. Um, and actually, that twelve point fourteen is not average house price. That's lower quarter house price. So they're not even directly comparable. Um, and that just gives you a an indication of some of the challenges which people who want to buy houses and move through houses. Um, are facing in the district. What that translates to is 78% of all first-time buyers are unable to afford an average terrace house in the district. The average rent uh, last month was £1,200 for a two-bed property in the district. LHA, so that's effectively housing benefit, that will cover £847. So it's quite, so it's, it's quite easy to see some of the challenges which our residents are facing uh, when presented with, with that sort of level of affordability or, or lack of affordability, I should say. But then we also have a huge number of demand challenges at the moment. So we have 6,000 uh, households on Home Search, Home Search being our single access point to social housing. Last, the last four year, we had 474 properties become available. 6,000 6, households uh, wanting housing and 474 properties become available in a year. Um, so very easy to see that, that mismatch. We have real demand for people for temporary accommodation at the moment. So a whole raft of issues, which is just talk about the fact that we have affordability challenges. Uh, we have a cost of living crisis. Uh, we have a shrink in, uh, although we have a large private rental sector, we're also having a little bit of shrinkage uh, due to a number of government changes and Airbnb, and that's, that's, that's creating a number of evictions. So what that is doing is that's putting pressure on our homelessness. Uh, and people come into us who are threatened with homelessness. We currently have 59, well, when I wrote that's 59, it, it's still about, I think it's around 60. We have around 60 households in temporary accommodation, and that's effectively doubled in the last three years, um, and it's continuing to go up. That's creating uh, huge challenges for us. And then finally, what I've put there is what I call a trend of complication. So effectively, things are just getting more complicated for us. So typically, when we're dealing with, say for example, a homeless household, they'd be homeless. Uh, because the landlord evicted them or, or something along those lines. Now what we find is they're homeless, but they may also have large debts. So, you know, 
8,000, 9,000 pound of debts is, is not uncommon. Uh, they may have a range of other issues, mental health issues. They may be dealing with other agencies. So everything for us is starting to get more complicated. And that's taken more and more resources to try and try and resolve things. That example was in homelessness, but it's exactly the same on our disabled adaptations. It's exactly the same in relation to rough sleeping. Things are just tend to be getting more complicated. And I think it's because effectively people have been through to us at a later stage um, as their crisis develops. I wonder if I could have the next slide, please, Sarah. This is very quickly just our uh, housing programs, um, but really the takeaway from, from this slide is more what we kind of pivot around our tiers of support. What we try to focus on is more homes, better homes and happy and healthy lives. So pretty much all our work is around those three pillars, particularly the last one. So more homes, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Better homes is about housing conditions and things. And then ultimately it's about happy and healthy lives. Sarah, I just wonder whether you can move on again. So more homes, what do we do for more homes? Well, we do a huge amount of work on more homes, really. Um, so we work a lot with our planning colleagues who I know are talking later on uh, tonight to deliver affordable housing. But actually, we do deliver a lot of affordable housing. So in the last 10 years, we delivered over 1,800 affordable homes. And that's a mixture of full rent and, and shared ownership. And there's a further 750 consented and waiting for, for build out. One of the really interesting things I'm doing at the moment is our direct delivery, so Baines Homes program. So I'm not sure if you've heard much about it, but what we're trying to do is leverage some of the council assets. So some of our spare land and some of our vacant buildings, trying to bring those back into use and to add some social value to them. Um, so we have a program which is about delivering supported housing, some shared ownership and for rent housing. Um, and so far, we've been already completed 33 units. We have another 14 on site. Um, and we have about 208 in, in the pipeline. And these properties are, are really, really important to, to us and, and to me personally, actually, because I, I think this is, this is really back to us taking the next step on. Um, and we also try to take off a number of other corporate objectives on these properties we're developing. So, Say, for example, a, a listed building we, we recently renovated for former rough sleepers, which now delivers 20 units of high quality accommodation for former rough sleepers, which is great in itself. But actually, we've also managed to reduce the energy consumption by over 40% in that building. Um, and it's one of the first buildings, in fact, I think maybe the first grade one listed building to have solar panels on the roof. Um, nobody knows because it's on the it's on the kind of uh, inner leaf of, of the road, of the uh, roof, but really, really a uh, real achievement, I think. And that's another supported housing scheme we're developing, and um, that's going to be air source um, heated. So, so again, one of the, in fact, the only supported housing scheme I'm aware of in the country, which will be air source heated. Sarah, I just want to very, very quickly move on, because I know the time is really tight, and I just want to kind of focus on a couple of other things. The other thing just to, to mention is our regulation enforcement role. Um, so as I said before, we have uh, a large private rented stock. When you add on a social stock as well, that, that makes it particularly large. So we have around 33,000 rented homes in the district. Uh, we are responsible for, you know, we're the regulator uh, for those housing conditions. Um, and particularly, you know, people will be aware of the really sad case recently of uh, Awab Shawab Shrak. Um, and that's really brought to people's attention some of the issues around housing conditions. So I do tend, you know, my, my, my view, and I've had this view for a long time, is sometimes we do get slightly sidetracked on new development and building new houses. And sometimes we lose sight of the existing stock. If anything, you know, this case has kind of reinforced that we do need to kind of have regard to the existing stock. 
Um, and so what we do is we have a, a licensing scheme for, for HMOs. Um, and we will also investigate any complaints if anybody uh, wants, you know, if any tenant has any complaints about our housing conditions, they can come to us. Interesting enough, I'm not sure this, you probably can't see, but that, that the right hand picture um, was a, uh, that is effectively a ventilation for a heating system uh, of an open source fire, which we discovered. So we went round a property uh, and effectively, that's a living room uh, with an open source fire uh, in it. And that pipe, which is now bent up, it was bent down, was over the fire and that was effectively the chimney. Um, and that landlord thought that was an acceptable way to operate a rented property. Um, that's not a atypical. We, we do deal with that, you know, those, they're quite shocking, some of the things we, we deal with. Whether we ever quickly we can have the next slide. And the last bit was just really very quickly just wanted to talk about um, housing allocations and uh, things. So, as I said before, we have around 6,000 households wanting, trying to secure social housing. Um, and as I said before, we had 474 vacant homes come up last year. What that means is it's down to simple averages, simple number of people to, you know, on the list wanting a particular property. If you split that down to property type, it means that if you're waiting for a three bed property and you're an average um, applicant on the list, it will take you 18 years, which is pretty bad, but not as bad as if you wanted a four bed property. Because if you wanted a four bed property, you'd be waiting on average 186 years. Now that's very simply just the number of uh, people who want these properties divided by the number of properties becoming so become available. So it's a very kind of rough uh, average and clearly what we do is we prioritize people. But it just does give you a little bit of a, a flavor for some of the demand in, in social housing. And actually the, the bullet point above just shows that if you're in urgent demand uh, for housing, so effectively that's people who are um, actually homeless um, or fleeing domestic violence or a whole number of other categories. Typically, you'll be waiting 44 weeks, something along those lines for, for permanent housing. And 70 weeks if, you, if you're a high priority and not urgent. Ah, I'm really mindful of time, so that's probably all I really want to, to, to say at this stage. You have this slide, so um, hopefully they'll be circulated. And if you have any questions on it, by all means, do get, get in touch with me and I'm happy to address them outside of the meeting. Graham, thank you very much for um, a less than sort of enthusing situation. But clearly, um, you and your team are looking at various innovations, which hopefully will give sort of ease to some people in the terrible situation that uh, we have with our housing currently. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, uh, Dave, you got your hand up. Dave Biddleston. Yeah, thank you. So just so that I get a better understanding of, of how all of this works, please. Um, so, Graeme, you, you take a strategic overview. So when we say uh, in the slide that uh, 1,800 uh, properties have been uh, built or created. That would be you working with the local housing groups like Curo and Persimmons and people like that. Is that correct? That's exactly that's exactly correct. So in relation to that, it is, it is a mixture. So there's a mixture of starting to become direct delivery. So we are starting to directly deliver some of our schemes, but the vast, vast majority of that is for our enabling work. So that's working with uh, colleagues, our planning colleagues, is working with the RPs, the registered providers, the curators, the sanctuaries, and, and so forth, and working to the developers. Our role is very much about ensuring that the delivery of the affordable housing is what we want in the right place and meeting the needs of our local residents. So that's around size, it's around tenure type uh, and design type. 
That's really helpful. I'm wondering what percentage of that 1,800 uh, would be taken by private landlords eventually under right to acquire or right to buy? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Um, simply, simply don't know, to, to, to be honest with you. What I can tell you to go forward, what I can tell you is that, um, I was just having a look at that, these figures this morning, actually. So since we transferred to stock the Curic, so um, I forget the exact number, that is around about 12,000, I think, between 10 and 12,000 stock, um, around 1,800 uh, has gone through right to buy um, during that period. So what's that, 30 something years? Quite a sizable chunk, isn't it? Yeah, because quite, quite a sizable chunk, and it's roughly, as you, you know, it's no, well, it's a coincidence. Uh, but it's rather interesting that is roughly the same number as what we delivered in the last 10 years. So Extraordinary. Last 30 years, what we delivered in the last 10 years. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you'd love to be in the position where you could actually start building houses again. And then that money that if it came to right to buy or right to acquire could go directly to the council to build more houses. That would sound like a very sensible. Well, as, as, as I mentioned, we are starting to build our own houses. So we're starting off small and we're using our existing land assets. But it's very much a start of a journey. Um, so we, we have the, the beginnings um, and we'll have to see where the journey takes us to ultimately. Graham, can we just squeeze one more question in? I know you want to go in a, about a minute or two. A Barron, I believe you uh, have a question or want to say something. In fact, it was my question was around the right to buy because this seems to have been a drain on councils across the country ever since it was introduced, and there wasn't any funding available to replace every property that went at a reduced rate on the right to buy. So you really do have your arm, arms behind your back. I was very impressed by all the positive things you were doing in your presentation. So thank you. But uh, if you can find a way of creating properties that don't fall under the right to buy, then you'll actually start making positive progress forward. But I'm sure you've got your head firmly around that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Graham, thank you very much uh, for what you've had to tell us. And thank you very much for what you're doing to try and resolve it. Uh, and have a good evening or whatever you're going to do as you leap away. Run into right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Graham. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs> okay, moving on then. Um, still sort of linked together, really. Uh, this is a local plan. Uh, we've had uh, apologies from Simon De Beer, uh, but uh, Karu Jacques, the principal planning officer with Baines. Uh, Karu, I believe you're going to give the update on the local plan uh, and to include feedback on recent workshops held. Is that is that correct? Yes, thank you. That's yes. good. Yep. The floor yep. is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's um, I'm Kaoru Jakes. And um, so I am a principal officer and also I'm leading the uh, local plan work uh, for uh, Kensham and the surrounding area. So I uh, just want to give you a quick update on our, our work program. So uh, Sarah, can I have a next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, last meeting, my colleagues Richard Dayon presented um, local plan work. And um, so since then, um, we adopted local plan partial update that was um, adopted by the council in January. So then um, it is the um, partial update of the core strategy and also placemaking plan. So it's uh, quite difficult to follow, but we made these composite plans so they're easier to read. Then I put the link there. And um, so hopefully when you uh, have these slides, you can have a direct access. And um, also we launched a um, new local plan uh, in October, November. We consulted on the uh, launch document, which sets out the, the scope of the new local plan. So then we are just finalizing the consultation statement. So we will put, and as soon as it's ready, we will put on the website. Um, Sarah, can I have a next slide, please? Thank you. So it's a new local plan. Um, many of you are probably involved in the uh, preparation of partial update. Then that was quite selective uh, scope. But uh, now it's a new local plan. It's a whole refresh. 
then we are uh, looking at all kind of um, issues. So it's um, it's local local plan covers wide range of topics and um, also the place um, um, strategy. So it's a new local plan uh, set the planning framework for the next 20 years. So that's up to 24, uh, 2042. And um, the local plan will set spatial priorities and also uh, spatial strategy, including a site allocations. And um, so the intention is that we will have um, a own section or, or chapter for Kensham strategy and Kensham and surrounding area. Then also it's uh, set out to develop a management policies. So then uh, this will uh, form the basis for future planning applications, uh, determination of applications. And the local plan will reflect the corporate priorities and also uh, a vast amount of evidence base and also uh, strategies. So the council is preparing economic strategy now and also um, health and well-being strategies. So all these things um, will feed into the local plan. Then we will see um, uh, set out the spatial element of these strategies. So then we are we will um, undertake a number of consultations. Then all your comments in the consultation uh, feedbacks all get uh, feed into the local plan. And there's a number of stakeholder engagement are already planned. Then also we took a few engagement events in January. Uh, so next slide, please, Sarah. So yeah. So this is the kind of broad uh, uh, process and the program. So we launched the project um, autumn last year. And um, also is now we are undertaking a number of stakeholder engagement events, workshops. And also we planned a um, number of um, hard to reach group um, workshops, like engaging with the youth group and also just working closely with the health and the wellbeing teams. So we are visiting a few. Um, it's a vulnerable communities uh, event. And um, so it's a now, uh, now is sort of uh, identifying issues and the priorities stage. And um, then soon in spring, we start to work on the potential options and also the potential site allocations. So then towards the end, um, we arrive to prefer the options then we consult on these options. We will develop these options with, um, with you and the other community groups and the key stakeholders. So then uh, arrive to a draft plan later next year, then go through the examination process. So um, can I have a next slide, please? Thank you. Yep. So it's a little bit about um, the stakeholder workshop we had uh, on 26th of January. Um, we commissioned a um, consultant called Arab, um, no, sorry, it's just the ACOM. So there's uh, ACOM is um, working with us to um, set the place assessment. So we're looking at the Kensham, Saltfoot in the wider area. And um, so they um, help us to plan this workshop and they gone through the baseline information. So, so they shared with us that all the evidence base we have and um, um, to set the sort of a base baseline. So then we had a work, um, group works. We started with them um, uh, sort of uh, what is um, nice in this area. So what's the key values uh, in this area? So there was um, the strong, um, um, there, there's a, clearly that there's a strong community uh, in this area. And also the people value this attractive countryside, it's access to green and blue space. That's, that is the sort of um, countryside, uh, Mana Road, Rutland, uh, Memorial Park, and also it's a nice river and um, public footpath. And so it's a good uh, access to green and blue space. And also it's um, Kensham, Saltfoot, uh, the location, um, has um, 
uh, positive uh, value. And this is uh, being close to both Bristol and Bath, and uh, it offers different types of experiences. And also it's access to main hospital in Bath and Bristol. And um, also it's um, the strong uh, local history and heritage that's, um, that is a base for the community um, sense of community. And can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So then um, we discussed about um, 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 issues uh, based on these uh, six schemes. These six schemes um, uh, theme were included in a placemaking charter. And um, so this, I won't go through uh, the detail on this one because um, we are now it's a finalizing a consultation and I mean workshop report. So we'd like to circulate this report so that uh, you can have a read and they say anything we missed, uh, we welcome your comments. Uh, can I have a next slide, please? Yeah, then I just um, wanted to mention about a key evidence base in preparation. So it's the first one is a local housing needs assessment. Um, as um, the Graham mentioned about um, this need for affordable housing and um, sort of things. And um, so we're working really closely with the housing team. And uh, this, um, the local housing needs assessment will set um, or indicate the overall housing needs for Bath and North East Somerset and also it's specific to Keynesham and surrounding area. So it's a, it is more of a demographic, demographic based sort of uh, requirement then also take into account the government standards method of calculating housing needs. Then um, it, this go into the affordable housing requirement as well. So what sort of affordable housing we need and um, also the what sort of housing we need to address aging populations. So this, uh, um, yeah, so then this is um, uh, already commissioned. So we should get uh, outcome in March, April. So, so that, that's time frame. And uh, next one is um, employment. Oh, sorry, sorry, still going through this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. So the employment uh, office and the industrial market assessment. So this um, assessment will set um, or assess the current supply and the demand for uh, office and industrial um, floor space, and also um, work on um, the future requirement. They will look at the different sector or businesses, then how they um, should grow, and that will tell us how we should, uh, how much more uh, employment space uh, local plan should allocate and where. And um, the next one uh, is a housing employment land availability assessment. So we are currently doing a call for sites so that any developers, landowners, community group, if they have any land uh, potentially uh, uh, suitable for housing or employment sites, they are putting a site to us then the um, planning policy team, we are going to assess these uh, sites, then that will inform the future allocations. And um, the student accommodation requirements, that's uh, more, more directly relevant to Bath, but uh, we are working with the universities, uh, Bath University and Bath Spa University, and um, looking at how their, their aspiration on their growth and uh, discussing how best do we accommodate future requirements. And um, also we're doing city, town, local center vacancy and the youth survey. So that will uh, help us to review the town center boundaries and also um, how best to protect uh, or how best to maintain the vibrancy of town center. So there's a more evidence based in preparation, but we would like, um, I would like to come back to give you the key outcome as um, um, we receive the draft report. So next slide, please, thank you. So the, the next steps is um, uh, once we have um, the stakeholders workshop feedback report, I uh, will circulate that with you. So then evidence sharing, um, as I mentioned, when we have uh, this key um, evidence-based report, I would like to come back here to share with you. 
and um, then start to generate and assess options in June, September uh, this year. Then hopefully, uh, yeah, it's at the end of this year, we will have a preferred options. So that is a sort of a broad um, uh, time frame and the next steps. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karu. Um, Andy Wait, you've uh, put yourself forward, as it were. As always. Uh, I was quite surprised that you said uh, that you were responsible for the Cancho and surrounding area. So I think I would be I think I will be right in saying that um, Cancham and the surrounding area have received significant housing in the last decade or further. Uh, so how is the allocation of housing going to go across the authority? I mean, how many people are doing a job like yours? I mean, it's been divided in in what way? I'm just trying to get my head around. I mean, and, and do you have, I assume that you're going to work with your other colleagues, but yeah, sure. how many, how many are there, how many people like you are there yeah. across Baines? Yeah, sure. It's, um, um, I mean, our policy team, we are about nine of us and um, the policy team, we lead, uh, some of us have uh, area responsibilities and also topic responsibilities. So then so I'm kind of leading, I mean, I work with all our colleagues and also we work with other services, housing, economic development, but for the local plan, it's, um, so I, I can lead uh, Kingsham area, then another officer leads Bath area, then um, another officer leads um, Summer Valley area and um, also rural. So that's the, the sort of place leads. So then another officer, I mean, all duplicates, but also um, lead housing policies or economic uh, policies of area. So it's um, the, basically the policy team is, we are nine of us, but we work with other services. So, so but I will coordinate the work for um, Kingsham area, local plan work. Okay, thank you for that answer. We have two, question, two questioners now. Um, and we've got a minute to do both questions and the answers. So, uh, Barend, you're first on. Um, it's just my MIS was from the previous speaker, so there's nothing new there. Excellent news. Thank you for that. David, uh, you have about a minute. Right? David okay, Roswell. I'll Thank you. My question is simple. How do we stop the uh, developers breaching the Bristol Bath Greenbelt with speculative development around Hitsgate? Because there's a number of them beginning to appear. I welcome the park and ride out there, but I don't welcome all the houses between Brisington and Kingsham. And how do we stop it? Um, that's um, um, we are we first we have to establish or prepare the evidence base. We have to look at um, housing uh, requirement, how much uh, we need to do. And also we have to consider all different area and to how to meet this requirement. So it's, um, there's a no nothing really um, uh, decided at this stage yet, but we have to establish the housing requirement. Then we have to consider the different spatial options. So then we have to consider pros and cons. And, um, but that's all we, we have to come up, uh, prepare the options. Then um, we go through the consultation. Everybody have an opportunity to comment on. And um, also, I just um, did you mention one thing that we are also working on um, the transport strategy alongside uh, this local plan. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for an interesting uh, update for us. And thank you very uh, much. you're welcome. We're now going to move on uh, to. The Transport uh, and West of England Authority and our speaker representing uh, Weka is Phil Wright, who is the Public Transport Programme Manager for Weka. Uh, which, well, for those who aren't aware, Weka is the area's transport authority. Uh, Phil, you're going to update us, I believe, and uh, take some questions, and I suspect there might be a few. Over to you. Yeah, do you mind if I, uh, I'm going to try and share my screen, bear with me one second. I did have a bit of a, a disaster with my uh, work laptop decided to die on me at about 10 to 5 this evening, so um, I'm 
working from my own laptop. So apologies in advance if um, if te technology doesn't quite line up for me. Bear with me one second. Yeah, th th thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so, so my name's Phil Wright. I'm a public transport program manager in the Command Authority. I've also got um, uh, a colleague of mine, Jonathan Hampson, um, who's joined us this evening, who uh, works for a company called Via, who is um, working on the uh, the app for the um, the demand responsive transport, Westlink, as it's called. Um, he, he, he will be a big help for some of the technical questions that we might get later, but he's also going to share a bit of information about that as well. Um, I guess I'm very aware of the fact that this is, um, uh, from my perspective, this is the most challenging project I've ever worked on with the timescales that we've got to get the system up and running uh, by April. Um, we, we got formal approval to, to start this around Christmas time. So um, very challenging timescales. Um, and one thing I guess we, one thing I'm gonna front end really is this is a fairly high level presentation notwithstanding the fact that we are still evolving this project and things are moving at such a pace that the joke, half joke that I, I give whenever I uh, talk to people is about every 20 minutes, the project changes. Um, I'm not too far away from that, to be honest, and I'm sure Jonathan will back me up. Um, every day is a different day and different things moving. So I'm trying to give you as much information as I can give you without giving you misinformation uh, because things may change. Um, so one thing we I won't be able to share these slides because I'll be honest by about this time by about Tuesday they'll be out of date um, and, and and irrelevant and the second thing is we're intending to have a, a more comprehensive campaign to get information out to people uh, happening later in March so there, there will be more information to come so um, uh, this group I guess so one of the guinea pigs of getting that information and, um, and and please do let us know any questions and it will help us hopefully to shape it um, so what is what is Westlink? Um, that's the, the brand name that we're using for this. Uh, where will it operate? How will it operate? How much will it cost? And how will it work? Um, so it's a demand responsive transport system. I guess the, the, the simple way of explaining that is it doesn't operate on a fixed route like a traditional bus service may do. Um, it's, it's not got a fixed timetable. It won't be at, at one point at one time. Um, so it can go anywhere within the operating zones, and I'll get onto those zones uh, very shortly. It isn't door to door, so it doesn't take away from um, other community transport schemes that may be out there. Um, but it, it goes from uh, bus stops or virtual bus stops, as we're calling them, where they may bus stops don't exist, um, and that we we appreciate there are some historic bus stops out there. Um, and so it goes from there to other designated points. Um, I think one of the strengths I see of it is it, it opens up opportunities to people who may not have had a bus service, um, certainly in, in the last five to 10 years. So it, I, I, I do appreciate where people may be losing a bus service, they may see it as a negative, um, but it they will still have an opportunity to access this service and it will open it up to other people who may maybe haven't had a bus service for, for a period of time. It will be able to link you in to existing rail routes and bus services. It obviously, what we hope is going to happen is it will be able to replace car travel and give people an opportunity to not have to use their car um, and where buses aren't available. Um, it only runs when it's booked. It doesn't just drive around like a, a standard bus service on a fixed uh, basis. So if nobody's booking it, it's not it's not moving. It's not going anywhere. Um, I'm hoping that won't be the case. I'm hoping we're going to have lots of people using it and um, it, it will be dr driving around the area regularly. And I say it. I guess one of the things is there, and I'm, I'm going to steal my thunder here. It's not just one bus that's driving around. So this is the uh, the map, just to give you a flavour. And um, I think you'll probably be able to zoom in quite quickly on that purple zone uh, there, which is which is Canesham. Um, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible um, from from this perspective. Um, we've got a northern zone, um, a southern zone, and what's called an FTZ pilot zone. If, uh, I don't want to get too complicated and drag us too much into what the FTZ is. It's the Future Transport Zone project, and they all, always intended to try all this with different payment structures, different times that they run um, to see which ones are well received and, and learn lessons from that. And that's going to be shared nationally. Um, but we didn't want to duplicate what they were doing. So it's a virtually identical service running in a, in a very similar way. Um, so they've got their own little zone. Um, but what, what we did appreciate was that Canesham 
was a bit of a, a unique situation in that it almost crossed the boundary between the two zones. And it would seem very remiss of us to have uh, people living just to the north or the south of one of those lines, not be able to get in or out of Keynesham by using this service. So Keynesham's kind of got a bit of a special status, as it were, here, that you technically will be able to travel in and out of the either of the northern or the southern zone from Keynesham um, for, for, for the, or, or into and certainly into Keynesham um, for, from this from this zone. And I should stress this map is I was in a meeting earlier. This map is evolving. So don't get too hung up on fine detail of this map. Um, things things may change. Um, just looking at really the, the zone in Keynesham. So what did that mean for Keynesham? I, I don't think it's it, it really is kind of the Keynesham urban area is covered by that. Um, so I, I don't want to get too hung up on this. I think it's uh, you, you guys know the, the area better than us, um, and, but it does cover the whole of the urban area for Keynesham for this sort of special status zone, as it were. Um, how will it operate? So it is an app based journey booking system. However, you can use the phone. We will have a call center available. Um, you will be able to go via a website um, or you can do a free download of the app um, to be able to book. Um, it is it is on demand. Um, you can book up to 24 hours in advance. You can't book weeks in advance. It is only 24 hours in advance. Uh, I think part of the reason for that was what we what, what the learning we've got from this. If people block book in advance, quite often they don't turn up necessarily to, to that journey. Um, so we're trying to encourage people to only book short term in advance. Um, the maximum wait that expected, and this is part of the contract, is that it will be 60 minutes is the maximum wait. Um, the smart technology that's sitting behind that, um, but behind the, the, all of this, will allow um, you it to be matched with other people who might want to make a similar journey um so you're not ending up having to go off on, on a long tangent um before you get to the place you want to go to and there will be uh, the 16 seat buses as i said uh, earlier not one there'll be 30 accessible 16 seat minibuses running across all of those zones um the, all all public transport services have to be accessible so they, they will be accessible uh, for, for for people with various disabilities uh, this the will launch operations on the Monday, the 3rd of April. Um, my, my colleague Jonathan's here, um, and, and I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you here. Drivers has been a challenge for us, given uh, the situation we've got um, nationally with drivers. But we believe we're going to be in a position where we will have uh, the drivers available to be able to launch the service on the 3rd of April. And um, uh, that we've been working with the operators to make sure that that is in place. Um, and those northern and southern zones, I guess the ones that are most relevant to you, will be operating from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, um, Monday to Saturday. There will be no Sunday service, um, but it will be uh, Monday to Saturday. Uh, just, just for information, I guess the FTZ pilot zone is, is running on slightly different time scales, uh, but they may adjust that. That is their pilot scheme, so they they may they may try all that and, and, and adjust it. But you, part of the reason for that is because um, they're operating in sort of the Avonmouth area where people are going to work at starting shifts at um, six o'clock in the morning. So it's uh, trying to get them, trying to get them to work in time for that and then picking them up after the end of those shifts as well. Um, how much will it cost? Well, it's broadly speaking gonna be in line with what the uh, fares are at the moment. So it will be the uh, two pound adult, one pound child fare. Uh, concessionary and older person's bus passes will be accepted on the service. Um, customers, um, whether they're booking by app, web, phone, whatever it may be, can pay by either by a debit card that will be attached to their account or they can pay cash to the driver if they if they want to or pay card to the driver if they want to um, in future we do plan to add different ticket offers such as a day fare and through ticketing with other operators such as um, other bus providers etc um, but that, that that's that's something we, we we won't have time to be able to have ready for the 3rd of april but we will we're working on that and we hope to have that in place sooner rather than later and then, Jonathan, do you want to step in at this stage and take take it through a little bit more about how it will actually work? Yes, very happy to. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Phil. Um, so just to introduce uh, myself, as, as Phil said, my name is Jonathan Hampson, and I am the country manager for a company called VIA, uh, and we are the technology provider behind the Westlink service. Um, we provide over 250 of these type services around the world, including 29 here in the UK. Uh, and obviously, as Phil said, we're busy working incredibly hard to ensure that the Westlink service is set up to meet local needs in the West of England. And we don't have too long, so I'm just going to quickly talk you through the passenger experience of using the Westlink service. Um, 
The first thing to stress is that while I'm going to show you, as you can see on the screen now, some images of the passenger booking app, public transport absolutely has to work for all. Uh, and so there are multiple ways that you'll be able to access the Westlink service, depending on your preference. As Phil has said, you can phone up, you can book by web, or you can uh, book using a mobile application. However you want to access the service, the first thing that you'll need to do is to create an account for yourself through any of the methods that I've just said. If using the app, you can download the app for free from either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Simply search Westlink, all one word, uh, and it will appear. Um, please note it, it won't if you do that today, uh, but it will obviously near the time. So, so please don't search for it for it now. Um, for security, uh, it will ask you to confirm your mobile phone number, uh, and then you will receive a code straight away to that number that you'll need to input. After that, you simply need to set up your account by putting in your name, email address, and password. You can also add a payment card to your account, making paying for your trips entirely seamless. So having set up your account, you are all ready to make a booking. Every time you go into the app, it will recognize your current location and ask you to set a destination that you want to travel to. You can set up favorite destinations such as home, work, or anything that you want. You can input address an address, or you can drag the pin as you can see on the left-hand image. Once you've done that, you can then set, press set to my destination. Um, and you will then be asked to add any extra passengers that may or may not be traveling with you. Uh, next slide, Phil. Um, and then you have two options uh, on when to book. Um, you can either travel now and you will receive a trip proposal for when your Westlink minibus will be with you. And as Phil said, this will normally be between five and 45 minutes, depending on the level of demand and where the vehicles are at, at that particular point. And on-demand booking is obviously great for, for more spontaneous trips. The other option is that you can pre-book a trip for later, which can be anything from the end of the following day up to 30 minutes before uh, you want, sorry, previous day, um, uh, anything up to 30 minutes before you want to travel. And you can either ask to depart at a certain time or arrive by a certain time. And pre-book trips, are great for trips that require specific timing, such as going to a doctor's appointment, getting to work at a specific time, things like that. In the case of a pre-booked trip, you'll receive an offer of a 30 minute pickup window. And then 30 minutes before that window, you will then receive an SMS narrowing that window to a precise pickup time so you know exactly when your vehicle is going to be with you. In both cases, you can see in the app where your vehicle is and when it's approaching, so you know exactly when to leave home or when you need to be ready for. You will also see details of the vehicle that's picking you up, so you know that you're getting into the right vehicle. Um, uh, the only other thing I would um, uh, stress is that, uh, or draw your attention to, is the image on the left, um, is that when booking, uh, if a fixed route bus is able to do your trip, you will also see details in the app uh, of the fixed route bus and the bus stop that you need to walk to to get that fixed route bus as well, if that's more suitable to meet your needs. So when the vehicle arrives and you're on uh, the vehicle, if you've elected to pay by credit or debit card, the payment will be taken automatically as your trip starts. So you simply get on the bus with nothing else required. If you're elected to pay by cash or concessionary fare, the driver will be prompted automatically to ask you for either, the, either of these as appropriate. And then that right hand image, um, uh, in the app, you can see your journey um, along with any other pickups and drop-offs on your route, as well as an ETA of when you'll be arriving at your destination. So that will be the passenger experience for Westlink. Phil, I'll hand back to you for, uh, and happy to answer any questions, of course. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I've, I've stopped sharing the images now. Um, I'm aware there will be questions. So just a couple of points I want to make just to finish on um, chair, if that if that if that's OK. okay. Um, the, 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 as I said, the presentation is, isn't for sharing because things are changing, that the, the images may look different. Um, what, yeah, I guess the point I'm trying to make is whatever you see in here tonight may change. It won't change substantially, hopefully, but it may tweak and change. Um, we are keen to engage with people. Um, I, I've been talking to um, some of um, people down in the Chew Valley area, and they, they, they're keen to see whether there are people who want to be, uh, for want of a better word, ambassadors who might want to tell us about things that aren't working as well or where 
we, we, we should do things differently or um, where, where things are working well. Um, so I'm keen to hear about that and please, please do um, pass your details on and um, I'm sure they'll find their way to me via, via um, Sarah and colleagues. Um, and other than that, I'll open it up to questions because I can see lots of hands up. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. All right. Sorry, I, my non-mute operator. <laughs> um, all I was saying was that it, it frightens me that lots of people are going to be disenfranchised who aren't into phones, who are happy to walk to a bus stop. And, and I would have thought with 30 minibuses, you could have run a timed service on a specific route, but that's only my opinion. Um, so we are going to go to Brian Simmons, first of all. Brian, you're muted. So which name, was it Baron you're asking? Uh, Brian Simmons. Still muted, Brian. Well, Brian gets unmuted. We'll go to Berend. I think you're next in line. I, I, I don't actually agree with Alan uh, on your points there. I think the fact no, that's that it's flexible, it's flexible to people's individual times is actually a fantastic concept. And it really does move away from having to force people into a once every two hour service, or whatever it is. So I think the concept is brilliant. The thing that I'm a bit disappointed about, it's like park and ride, is that there's no provision for evening activities for those of us who live out in the villages to cover the ability to go into theatres, cinemas and so forth, or just go out and have a good meal with a good drink to avoid us um, having to use our cars. So I know it's difficult to get staffing late at night, but it would be great if park and rides and your service would look at moving on to even longer hours than you've got on your um, special uh, trial trust uh, trial group thank you baron phil do you want to answer that one or do you want to i don't know do you want to leave them till the end i'm, I'm, I'm okay. scribbling them down so i'll do it at the end all right um brian brian simmons <laughs> yeah sorry i couldn't get the microphone up on the bottom of the screen because i'm not using my bain's computer because i'm locked out of it um these buses are going to be low emission vehicles that's one of the things I want to know. And um, will if you if you book a trip to connect with one of the strategic routes, what happens if the bus is early and you miss it? That's the two questions I've got. All right, Brian. Thank you for that. Um, Dave Biddleston. Yeah, I'd like to, first of all, echo Baron's point. There's very little point to having uh, these wonderful whizzy bus services if we can't use them after six o'clock. I think that's a really important thing. I'd love to know uh, whether you've computer modelled it to work out whether you can get to where you think that you can get within the 60 minute window. That would be really important. As we can see, um, and as we've seen for a long time, uh, older people struggle with technology. You're uh, asking them to use yet another app, and I know that's not, that's not going to be popular, but what's going to be even worse is that when you're stuck in the middle of Compton Dando with no phone signal, you can't use the app at all to book. Uh, so have you given any consideration to having Wi-Fi on board your buses? Uh, that would only solve the problem when you're on it, of course. Thank you, David. Um, get my, yeah, fish counter. Hello. Uh, two two questions. One is um, does fully accessible mean you can get wheelchairs on on these buses? Um, and the second question is, um, uh, yeah, a lot of people won't want to use the app. They'll do the phone system, but if they've used their landline to ring up and book something, how are they going to find out the information about the time of arrival and all the rest of it that you would get? if you were using the app. I can see the app 
yep, if it all works well, it's brilliant. I'm happy with apps, a lot of people aren't. So, um, yeah, how, how do you get the information about where the bus is, when it's arriving, and so on, if you phoned up the day before uh, for, uh, for a, a journey? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. David Regwell. Thanks, Alan. My questions are about the zones, really. As we've got, you and I were at the meeting last night, got about 42 mainline services going, and even most of the services now are across South Bristol. And when first announced tomorrow, a lot more cuts, which they're going to. Obviously, there's a list embargo, but it's not good news. My concern, uh, Phil, is about getting from Cainsham to South Bristol, bearing in mind that the only bus left will be the A4, Alan. So we need to be able to get across towards Asda and towards uh, particularly the hospital, the um, Big Whitchurch Hospital. And also just simply, we do need to get and make sure the day riders, the Avon riders and all the fares that WEC are own are simply put into the apps as soon as possible so you can make through journeys both onto rail at Cainsham Station. But that's, that's my issues about getting to South Bristol really because the main services are going. Thank you, David. Adrian. Inker, Adrian. Thanks, Alan. A lot of the questions I want has already been asked, so I won't go over them again. But just two things, actually. You mentioned about the finishing at seven o'clock at night. You also mentioned the Sunday, which is not being covered. Um, I know a lot of appointments now at local hospitals is done on a Sunday. So there's definitely going to be a need for a Sunday service to pick that up. Um, the other one, one of the big problems that First Bus seems to have is recruitment. I'm just wondering how confident you are to be able to recruit the numbers to cover the 30 buses in the light of uh, First Bus not being able to seem to do it. The other thing is, I think David touched on this, although it's a standalone project, and in, in essence, it could be a very good project as well. Majority of the people in Kenshin is seeing this very much in the light of the bus cuts that David touched on. Um, and I can see for a lot of people, it's going to do nothing to alleviate the problems they're going to get as a result of those bus services going. Um, it, it just seems to me that perhaps a bit more attention will be put to that as well as, as the service that you're talking about. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, that I think that's the extent of it. So, Phil, uh, it's back to you to cover on those questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I will call my colleague Jonathan in because there's a few in there which I might need some technical help with. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom because that's the easiest thing for me to do with, with the last one. Um, um, as far as the, the the other bus services go, the, the only thing I can add to really that is um, my, my role at the moment is managing what's called the bus service improvement plan. Um, the, the DRT uh, Westlink has been funded through the bus service improvement plan. Um, there was very clear guidance about what that funding could be allocated to, um, and it had to be to innovative transport um, solutions and um, and commercially viable solutions. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the existing supported services did not have a long term commercially viable um, option for them and a solution for them. So hence why we can't use this funding to support those services. Um, and, you know, it's it. it it, it is a very difficult message and I completely, completely appreciate that. And we have asked that question three times now to the Department of Transport, um, but uh, we've got the same answer. Um, they're, they're very clear on, on that one. Um, driver recruitment. Um, it's one of the ones that I might bring Jonathan in to help with this. Um, I, you know, I, I think I flagged it. We, we knew it would be a challenge. And we, it, it, uh, if you'd have asked me the same question about three weeks ago, uh, you would have probably got a very different answer. But we, we have come up with a, a solution where we think we may have the drivers, and we, well, that makes it sound like we might not have the drivers. Uh, uh, an interim solution where we're, we're hoping to get agency drivers in as a short term solution um, on the basis that recruitment will continue to happen to get the permanent drivers in um, by by hopefully by the summer. Um, Jonathan, anything you want to add to that? No, other than yes, absolutely agree. Clearly, a very probably the single largest challenge we face in this project and getting it up and running is, is driver recruitment. I think we all uh, knew that when we took it on. Um, I, I think, as Phil said, we're making good progress with uh, the re recruitment of full time employees into the service, but that will need to be boosted by agency drivers in the short term. So um, uh, we've spoken to agencies. We have those committed. So we are confident that we will have the drivers needed um, by April the 3rd when the service goes live. Thank you. Um... One about Sunday services and, um, and later nights cropped up several times throughout this. So I'll do one catch-all uh, response to that, if that's okay. Um, 
you know, we, 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 we tended and, and got partners on board on the basis of, um, I guess, existing supported services and their, and their operating times. Um, we're very clear that we want this to be a success. And if, it, if it's going to be, be a success, and it, that means extending times, then we, we'll have that conversation and we'll have that conversation with the operators and we'll see if we can find some more money to try and make that happen. Um, at, at the moment, I guess we're, we're, we're tentative about how, how, what the uptake is going to be like. So we will we will we'll start on that basis of, of what we've what we've presented, but it doesn't mean that there won't be scope at a later stage to look at whether we can be flexible with those times. Um, getting the getting the tickets uploaded, I think uh, uh, that's absolutely something. I think I've already said we, we're keen to make sure we do get those other those different ticket offers uh, loaded. We just work, we, we won't be able to get them ready for for the launch date, but that that's something we're working on and we will continue to work on. Um, you talked there, I think it was David Regwell talked about the Kingsham to South Bristol to getting to the hospital there. If I go uh, back to that zone map, um, that, that, that it does take you to the head, edges of Engrove Park um, in that southern zone. Um, so it is technically something you can do um, to get into, into parts of South Bristol. So that's fine. Um, Jonathan, one for you to help with really was the uh, how do you find the live info if you phone to book? Um, I guess you get given that info, don't you, when you when you make the booking on the phone? Yes, absolutely. So th there's no doubt about it. I think if you book by app, I can come back to that. Then obviously you get very visual information. You can see exactly where the vehicle is. If you book by phone, then a couple of things you'll be told by um, uh, the call center agent um, details of exactly where you need to go. Uh, so you get given details of the bus stops, so you know where your pickup point is. And then there's a couple of things in terms of information. If you have a phone registered to your account, then you will receive an SMS message uh, of when the vehicle is five minutes away, when it's arrived. If you don't have any kind of mobile phone, then the other thing that we can do uh, is send an automated voice message to your landline. So you still know when the vehicle is coming, um, but as an automated message to your landline. So you know, we completely... Uh, appreciate that you will get slightly differing levels of information depending on how you choose to book but we hope that however you choose to access the service uh, you will get an appropriate level of information to be able to complete your trip successfully thank you i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna maybe defer to the getting the wheelchairs on on the buses um can you help with that one as well jonathan yes so all of the vehicles do take wheelchairs uh, and i guess one of the things that uh, a couple of things i'd say one is uh, the provider of the operations uh, actually has a background in medical transport, and so they are very used to helping uh, passengers who have additional needs get on and off vehicles. From a technology standpoint, um, when you register, you register any additional mobility needs you have and whether you require a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Now, all of the vehicles are wheelchair accessible, but what that does is flag that uh, when you book a vehicle, we then know that you need a wheelchair uh, space. Uh, and so uh, we don't end up in a position where you get the vehicle turns up and there's already someone with a wheelchair on board and we, you can't be accommodated. That will never happen. Um, so the technology is quite clever to make sure the right vehicle is assigned that can fit to you and your requirements to it. Um, there was one around there. And again, I might need to help with this, one, Jonathan. Phone signal in rural areas um, um, and, wi and Wi-Fi accessibilities. Uh, I think the, the, the option there was Wi-Fi on buses. I know it's something we're looking at for bus stops is, is upgrading and, and providing better Wi-Fi at bus stops. It, it, you've got any experience of that? Yes, for sure. So, I, I mean, a lot of the services that we offer are highly rural. And, and I'm just going to pick on one actually to make a couple of points. Um, uh, for the, I hope you don't mind, but... Uh, we provide a service called Flexi in Wales um, that is a nationwide demand responsive service that, that operates in 13 different parts of, of Wales. Um, two points about that. One is um, we've done a lot of passenger surveys of people who use that service and the age demographic that use it and have very high satisfaction rates uh, is incredibly broad from the very young to the very old. So we really do believe that, that demand responsive transport services can work for, for all ages and, and really do. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and from a, a rural point of view, I think from a booking point of view, if there isn't mobile phone reception, obviously you can book by a landline and, and get receive the information that I had before. Um, from a, a vehicle standpoint, um, uh, effectively the technology is set up that if you go out of a place with phone signal, uh, the information is cached. So then when you go back into uh, some other reception, it then updates. Uh, so the driver always knows who they're picking up next and that kind of thing. So, so the, the technology is certainly built 
for to work in very rural, rural areas and does uh, another service that, that we work with is, is called Tees Flex uh, in uh, the Tees Valley in the northeast of England highly highly rural service so yes there's definitely some more challenges in areas without mobile phone reception but but the services can work very well in that context as well and, 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 and I think the next two, hopefully the last two, Jonathan, well, I might need your help around it. There was a question there about just a genuine question about can the buses get around in the 60 minute window? I guess from my perspective, we've got 30 buses. We've got a contract. Um, so, you know, that that that's and these guys have got experiences running this type of service. So um, I I don't envisage that being a being an issue. Yeah. And so, the other one was about so, the low emission vehicles as well. Um, Jonathan, sorry, before you were going, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll set you to the. I'll do the second one first then. Um, so on the low emission vehicles, so to begin with, um, uh, and because the time scales are quite tight, we will be using not new, but still Euro 6 standard vehicles. Um, but uh, in at the beginning of July, an entirely new, uh, bought new fleet uh, arrives that will replace those. So because the time scales were a bit short, we couldn't source brand new fleet from launch but they will still be uh, relatively new. And I, I received the registration plates the other day, and I think they're two to three year old vehicles to start off with, but will be replaced in July with brand new vehicles. So um, uh, in terms of, um, what was the other question, Phil? Um, never mind, like I said. Uh, this a genuine question about, can you get around in 60 minutes? Can oh, you, yes, yeah. sorry, apologies. Um, yes, so we, we have a lot of simulation software that allows us to plan services to, understand how they will perform in any given vehicles, uh, vehicle numbers for any given quality of service parameters that the department provides. Um, you know, we are very confident that that, that uh, level is, is achievable. Um, obviously, all services are, are a function of supply and demand. So it does depend on, on what kind of demand that, that we see. And we've made some assumptions of that working with the command authority. Um, but but yeah, we will learn a lot. But, but from our experience and, and the tools that we have, we believe that um that's entirely possible uh, and we should have no problem with that but uh, we will learn of course there'll, there'll be a lot of learnings to take from this service uh, in the early days that it, so as phil said there's a lot of uh, evolution going into the planning of the service but equally when the service is launched it's not then a static service that then doesn't change uh we'll constantly evolve it to make sure it is meeting needs yeah and i, I think i can't i can't stress that enough not only is this evolving very rapidly up to the launch date it will evolve continually after that as well it won't be a fixed fixed point in time and that's it it will only have a look like that uh, alan i think i've only got one more question left which was around the connection which i haven't covered yet which was connection with uh, strategic routes which is actually quite an important one one of the key things we looked at was how do we get people onto those higher frequency corridors um seeing as the services don't take them into the bristol city center or bath city center for example um and we we are very keen to make sure that we look at how we use the BSIP funding, the Bus Service Improvement Plan funding, to look at whether we can enhance some of those commercially viable services. Um, we're, we're hoping there's going to be an announcement in the next few days. We've been negotiating with the operators to look at whether we can do that, um, which should give better, people better connections into those uh, services because we're very aware some of them are very low frequency at the moment. Um, one of the things we're also looking at doing, which was um, a project as part of the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement, which is the big sort of half a billion pounds worth of funding for for infrastructure you, you may be aware of um, is how do we improve some of the waiting environments as well so that people have um, a more attractive uh, waiting environment if they do have to wait but we're hoping that we will we will improve that frequency to a maximum of 20 minutes waiting time um, worst case scenario you've just been dropped there and you've got to wait 20 minutes till the next bus turns up um, that's what we're working on at the moment, um, and we hope to have that in place. And again, it might not all be in place for April, but that's the, the plans we're working on is to to ensure that we we, we do that to, to make make the system all tied together, really, as as, as well as we can. Uh, I think I think I've covered everything off. If if anybody feels I haven't, then please do let me know. Well, thank you for um, the uh, information you've imparted. Also, Jonathan. Um, clearly, there are concerns, and you know there are a, a divergence of opinion. To be fair, um, and I'm sure that, uh, or I hope that you will keep us up to speed as things move on, because uh, obviously, if there is information, it can be circulated from, uh, if you like, this centre to those that normally receive updates. So, um, thank you for your time, and. Uh, also, your timekeeping, not too bad at all, um, particularly as we're talking about buses. So um, 
thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, just to keep a couple of bits of information. Um, no forum meetings will be held during the pre-election period, which commences on the 20th of March uh, until after the election on the 4th of May. And then the next scheduled meeting of this Cainsham Area Forum uh, is Wednesday the 28th of June. Um, the updates will be circulated uh, at, after this meeting or, well, in the next day or two. Um, and the, the only other thing that I perhaps ought to tell you about, particularly if you like reading, I have just published my autobiography and it's available on Amazon, The Musings of Retired Policemen. So if you've got nothing else to do and want something to read, you might enjoy it. Anyway, that's the advert. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for the contributions that you've given. Um, I think we always have a constructive meeting and I hope you feel that it has been constructive. Uh, so um, with no more to say, really, Thank you very much. And oh, I possibly forget to do this every time is to say thank you to Sarah and Alison because uh, this end only works with uh, their abilities uh, and they have to put up with me sat here with them as well. So, you know, life isn't all um, a sort of a bit of roses, as it were. So, thank you very much, folks. Uh, we will see you in uh, June. Well then, stay safe. Have a safe journey home. Oh, you're there, aren't you?